Blue Badge Tourist Guide, one of around 600 members of the Association of Professional Tourist Guides that look after the Guide London website. Now, if you're a regular viewer, you know that every week at this time, we introduce you to some aspect of life in London, whether it's London's culture, its history, important buildings, or important people who live in this great city. Um, we've been going for over a year now and bringing you these reports. And if you've missed any of them, you can find them all on our YouTube channel or on Facebook. Just simply go and search for Guide London. You can find our archive there. Do watch some of our videos, share them with your friends. We want as many people as possible to see the videos. We have over a, a thousand subscribers now, thanks to everyone who's been watching. So if you can re recommend our broadcasts to your friends, we'd be very grateful because we want you to find out about the delights of London and then we want you to come and see us in person and we can show you a bit of the city when we are allowed to, when the lockdown is finally lifted and we're, uh, we're heading in that direction now. Now today we've got a slightly different broadcast in that we're not um, looking at one particular area of London, we're not looking at one building or one person or one famous incident about London. Today we're going to look at London's Spanish connections because of course England and Spain are two great nations that have been linked for many, many years, the two great uh, European powers that um, set their tentacles out around the world. And there have been many connections over the years between um, London and Spain. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by my colleague, the London Blue Badge Tourist uh, Guide, Maria Moroti, Hello. who is a guide um, who guides in Spanish uh, as well as English. And she's going to tell us all about those places in London that are associated with Spain. We are broadcasting live, so if you've got any questions for Maria about any aspect of Spanish connections with London, just put them in the comments and we'll try and answer them at the end of the broadcast. But for the moment, I'm going to hand over to Maria to tell us all about Spanish connections in London. Maria. Thank you, Nick. Hello, good afternoon. So yes, my name is Maria, quite a Spanish name. And um, well, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Spanish connections in London. And as Nick was saying, there are many. I mean, there's not enough uh, time in, in one of these broadcasts to tell you about all of them. But we've made a small selection. And um, so the very first one is all the way back in the Middle Ages, Leonor of Castile. And um, of course, she uh, came to England. She, she married a very famous king, Edward I, Longshanks. I'm sure you've heard of him. Now, they were married when they were very young. Edward I was uh, only 15 and Leonor herself was like 13 years old. And it was a beautiful love story. They had 15 children. They um, they spent a lot of time together, so much so that Eleanor even accompanied Edward I on one of the crusades, on the Ninth Crusade. Now, uh, she, she died at a young age of 49 and um, the king was totally, totally devastated. So um, she died in, in the West Midlands. And so on the way back, everywhere where they stopped with the, um, the coffin of, of Queen Eleanor, um, the king decided to put up some of these crosses. And you might have come across some of them. Now, the one you can see here in the picture is the one by Charing Cross. This is not the original, but it was the last of the resting places. And there were in total 12, and this one was at the time, the last one and also the most lavish one. And the one we can see here now is a replica of the um, 19th century. So it stands there at Charing Cross right by the station. Um, now, Queen Eleanor, she was, um, we can see her effigy here. Um, she was buried in one of the most beautiful churches in, I'd say London, but I'd say in the world, of course, Westminster Abbey. Now, I'm sure you've heard a lot about Westminster Abbey. We've been talking about um, Westminster Abbey a lot during during lockdown. Um, and that's where she's buried. Edward I as well, he's buried um, not far from her. Um, and um, now their love story, as I say, has been uh, documented in, in many ways, but there's also a lot of urban myths. For example, one of them was that Edward I um, had an injury in during the Crusades and she actually uh, sunk the, the, uh, the blood of Edward I and so uh, he got rid of the of, of of whatever the infection was, which probably isn't true, but uh, they told us that story. And another story relates to an area in London uh, that you might be familiar with, which is called Elephant and Castle. Now, according to legend, it, it was said that um, 
they couldn't pronounce Infanta de Castilla, which is how you, the official title of the princess in Spanish, and that that's why the area was called Elephant and Castle. However, um, if you've come across one of the um, livery companies in the city of London and you've been past the, the building of the Cutlass Company, then you might have seen that there is an elephant with a castle on top, um, and it's probably much more related to the Cutlers, um, where the... the the knives that they would make and um, other type of utensils they would have an ivory um, handle. So that's probably where the name really does come from. But it's a nice story and it's a way to um, remember Eleanor in, in any case. Um, now, the next part where we're going to is, uh, of course, another very famous Spanish princess, Catherine of Aragon. Now, Catherine of Aragon, she came to England not to marry Henry VIII. Now, we all know that she did marry Henry VIII, but uh, eventually, first of all, she married her elder, his elder, elder brother, which was um, Arthur. Now, um, they got married in St. Paul's, in the old St. Paul's in London, and we can see um, a house here. Now, if, if we get a closer picture of that house, you can see there's a, there's a grey plague where it says that both um, Christopher Wren and also that he lived there whilst he was doing the cathedral. Um, and also that Queen Catherine stayed there overnight when she came over to um, to England. Now, neither of the, those two statements are, are true. There's a famous book by um, the historian Gillian uh, Tyndall who, who totally explains that it can't be true because the house was actually built in the beginning of the 18th century. So uh, neither of them could have could have actually been there. But um, that plague that is there actually um, um, is the reason why we still have that beautiful 18th century house because they were going to build some flats. And uh, because there was that claim to fame, um, the house survived. So in a way, we're quite lucky to, to still have it. Now there's a picture coming up um, of three famous people. They're all related. And of course we've got Catherine of Aragon and we can see um, her daughter as well. Uh, she became queen, uh, Mary Tudor. Now Mary Tudor, she didn't have any children but she did marry and she married a Spanish king, Philip II. Now Philip II, um, he uh, didn't always see eye to eye with the, um, with the English. In fact, after uh, Mary Tudor had died, it, he didn't really spend a lot of time in England uh, whilst they were married, but definitely um, not after they, uh, after she'd, she'd passed away. In fact, he became um, sort of an enemy of the English because he was the one that sent the very famous Spanish Armada our way. Now, the Armada uh, in Spanish, it says the Invincible Armada, La Armada Invencible, and, and nobody thought that uh, that um, could ever go down but it did i mean of course in the uk in, in england we um we always sort of give the credit to a gentleman called sir francis drake and we'll see um, um a replica of the golden hind in in a moment now um whenever i go past this bit of london with spanish tourists they sort of uh, they, whenever you, you mention the name Francis Drake, they don't really like it. He's uh, more of a villain there. I mean, they don't see him as being uh, responsible for the Armada failing. They sort of say it had far more to do with the weather than it had with Francis Drake. Now, Francis Drake isn't only um, a bit of a villain in Spain because of the Armada. Um, it has a lot to do with all that happened in um in, in the area around uh, Panama, around the Caribbean, where they would uh, um, sack the Spanish ships. So um, he's considered as a villain and a pirate in Spain. So yes, whenever we go past here, they don't, they sort of don't like um, Francis Drake that much. He's not very popular. Plus they feel a bit offended because um, um, I don't know whether you've heard about the fact that when the Armada was on its way, um, he was actually playing uh, a game of bowling. And um, they, they told him, like, the Armada is arriving. He said, oh, I'll have time to finish this game of bowl and then, and then deal with the Spanish. And that's still regarded as something that they don't like very much in Spain. So yes, Francis Drake is definitely not one of the heroes. Now, our next slide is going to take us to uh, um, two other people who are, in a way, a bit of villains and a bit of heroes in Spain. Now, the Napoleonic Wars, of course, we've got Nelson. Now, Nelson is famous for many things, but of course, his last battle is the one that we all remember, the Battle of Trafalgar, where he actually sadly lost his life. Now, that battle was held in the southern part of Spain, in a region called Cadiz, in Andalusia, and it's um, there's a, there's a, a 
a, a bay there, which is called El Cabo de Trafalgar, and that's where the battle took place, which is why it's called the, the Battle of Trafalgar. Now, um, at the time, Spain and France were uh, joined, so they 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 sort of supported each other, and because France ha had these wars with England, Spain had no sort of choice but to um, share that that um, that battle with with the French. So um, it was a clear victory of the British, um, and yes, there are a lot of references to Napoleon, sorry, to Nelson when you go to that part of Spain. However, the one that is um, a lot better valued in Spain and, and much loved is um, the Duke of Wellington. Now, I've got a picture of the Duke of Wellington and the next one is of Apsley House. Now, the Duke of Wellington, he came at a time when the Spanish really needed him because um, the French had sort of taken over Spain. And uh, one of the brothers of Napoleon was um, at the time sort of the regent in, in Spain, uh, Joseph, they called him, Joseph Bottle, because he used to drink a lot, so they called him Joseph Bot Jose Botella. Anyway, so he wasn't, um, yeah, people didn't really like him. So when um, the Duke of Wellington became successful in uh, the Iberian um, Peninsula, um, they were quite grateful for, um, for the Duke of Wellington. And he gave, became, he, got a title, which is uh, the Duke of Ciudad Rodrigo, Duque de Ciudad Rodrigo, which is a city near Salamanca in the heart of Spain. And he and, and the actual Duke today still holds that title. And he was given a lot of presents, uh, um, amongst others, um, a beautiful villa in the southern part of Spain where the Dukes still visit um, now and then. And in Apsi House, you can see quite a, um, a few paintings that used to belong to the Spanish royal collection. They were presented by King Ferdinand VII of Spain to uh, the Duke of Wellington. And amongst those, there's um, um, works by Goya and Velázquez. So quite a, a, a lovely collection and some, some bits of Spain in Apsley House. Now, we move a bit further up to Marylebone and another museum with a beautiful collection, which we're going to see the picture of in a minute. It's the Wallace Collection. Now, what does the Wallace Collection have to do with Spain, you may think? Well, today, not much, but in the past, in that building, we had the Spanish Embassy. And around the area, there were a lot of um, uh, references to Spain. There was um, um, some of the street names have changed, but you had the Spanish steps. You had yet a lot of references to Spain at the time. And um, through the embassy, um, a Roman Catholic church, which uh, we can see now. This is this this church is from the 19th century. The 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 building it's, it's Gothic, uh, although it is Gothic from the 19th century, and it's dedicated to Saint James. And Saint James is a patron saint of Spain. And um, to, this year is actually one of those holy years. So what happens is that every time that in, during a year, the 25th of July, which is the day when we remember St. James of Compostelle, it's sort of St. St. James of Compostelle that day, um, and it falls on a Sunday, then that is a holy year. So what that means is that uh, the traditional pilgrimage, El Camino, that you can take from different parts of Europe um, and go through the north, through the Pyrenees, through the north of Spain, all the way to Santiago de Compostela. If you do it on the holy year, then you can enter through the holy door into the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. And um, they opened that on the 31st of December at midnight and it, it's open for the whole year. So if you do that, if you've done the pilgrimage and you've gone through that door on a holy year, then all your sins are forgiven. So it's quite important. Now, um, unfortunately, because of COVID this year is going to be a bit difficult. So what has been decided by the Vatican is that um, they're going to move it to next year. So Next year is going to be holy year instead of this year, so that pilgrims can make their way to uh, Santiago. And it's actually quite um, a special year because it's in, in one century you wouldn't have more than 14 holy years because of how the leap years work. So it's quite it's quite a um, an important year, the, the holy year. Now this church, as I say, uh, today it's got no connections with Spain since the middle of the 19th century. No official connections to Spain, I should say, because it still has uh, unofficially quite a lot of relationships with the Spanish embassy. So um, still up to today, it's it's um, it's regarded sort of a bit of a Spanish church in, in although it's got no uh, real connections, but unofficially it still has quite some connections to, to Spain, this church. It's a lovely church from the inside as well. It's absolutely stunning. So if you are around Marylebone, you've got a few spare hours, then you can go to the Wallace Collection and just next door, you can see St. James's, this beautiful Roman Catholic 
church. And from there we go to Belgravia where we do have the um, actual embassy and there are some statues around there. Now if you walk around Bel uh, Belgrave Square in the heart of, of Belgravia, you'll see that there are a lot of flags. Uh, you've got these beautiful white stucco buildings and there are a lot of flags from different countries. And if you look, you can see this Spanish embassy, this Portuguese embassy, this flag of Argentina. So there's quite a bit um, to see around that square and a lot of statues. Now I've selected two. Uh, one of them, I mean, not, neither of them is actually Spanish. One of them is Christopher Columbus. Of course, he was important because he um, was the one who got paid by the Spanish king and queen to go over to America and um, discover America. Now in 1992, it was the 500th anniversary of that famous legendary trip and the Spanish embassy created this um, sculpture and on the other side of the square there's the, the the more sort of modern history with with America and we can see a statue of Bolivar, Simon Bolivar who was um, Venezuelan and who was responsible of course for um, the the end of the Spanish rule in a way if, if you like it in, in um, Latin America so he's quite important uh, for that reason and then the next uh, building we have on this picture is the embassy and you can see it there with the Spanish flag. Now the embassy, um, we have a consulate and an embassy and the embassy um, is also is responsible for a lot of things amongst others um, to sort of provide cult, Spanish culture um, abroad. So amongst many initiatives there is the Instituto Cervantes which is quite important um, and, and they uh, offer Spanish um, lessons and they sort of make sure that Spanish culture gets represented everywhere in the world. So every embassy will have um, um, the Instituto Cervantes. They, they moved recently, they're now near the near Oldwich, uh, near the Strand, but they still depend on the embassy. And there we can see that beautiful building. It's a standalone stucco building. It's absolutely stunning. Now, Portobello, we've talked about um, Drake before and Drake died off the coast of Portobello in Panama. Um, now that is actually the origin as well of the name of the area because Portobello used to be a farm and um, Portobello Market, the name Portobello holds um, a relation to that part of the world as well. And what we can see there is the uh, Instituto Canada Blanche. Now this is quite impressive. It depends again on the embassy and this is a Spanish school for uh, Spanish pupils who live in the UK. Now, they have a Spanish curriculum, they have Spanish teachers, and so um, um, a lot of families that are established here, maybe they one of the partners is, is British and the other is Spanish, they're both Spanish, um, they like to take their child to, to that school. Um, they come out completely bilingual, but they follow the Spanish curriculum. And as I said, the teachers are brought over from Spain um, and it, it, it's very popular and it's got a quite a, a good rating. So they're still rated by Ofsted, but they are um, paid for and they are um, um, organized by the Spanish embassy, although there is a small fee to pay. So it's not a completely uh, free school, but it, it it's definitely something that people from Spain that live here uh, like to send their children to to that school and they also have as you can see um, again Cervantes, Miguel Cervantes is of course very important <laughs> probably most important writer in in Spanish history and he um, in this school there's also a center which is something that is very popular in Spain generally where we have centers for the over 60s where they can do all sort of activities from you name it knitting I mean here you can actually go and do line dancing you can uh, learn to dance flamenco, um, uh, you can just go in and have some cookery lessons. I mean, they have all sorts of activities for the over 60s um, that are Spanish and live in London and just want to have um, a bit of a social uh, life. So that's where they, um, they can go. Now, very close to this shop, to this um, school is a famous shop. It's called uh, Hermanos García. García Hijos, García and, and Son, sorry. Um, so they've been around forever and they, they are from the northern part of Spain, from Galicia. Um, and they have a, you could, you could call it a delicatessen shop, but really for a Spanish person living in London, it is your Spanish supermarket in London. You can find all the brands that you would normally find in Spain and that are really difficult to find here in uh, 
uh, in the UK or anywhere abroad. So it's quite nice. You can go and get your favorite biscuits or your favorite shower gel or um, just some nice um, sauces. You can have um, some really good chorizo and um, ham, Spanish ham, wonderful cheeses. So yes, it's it's a big institution with the Spanish. Um, and during the pandemic, they've been very busy um, with people buying all sorts of things there because they've been open the whole time, fortunately. Now, uh, talking about food, um, of course, there's a huge heritage of Spanish food. And I've I've done a bit of a selection. Um, Brindisa, because I, I just love Brindisa. I mean, Brindisa started in the 80s in the east of London, and they started very small and then and then became bigger and bigger. Now there's, they've, they've got branches. They've got different um, restaurants all over London. This is the one in Borough Market, which I think is the most famous of all of them. Apart from excellent food, you can um, also go to the to their shop, to their delicatessen shop, and now they have amazing ham. I mean, absolutely amazing and, and really good olive oil. So, uh, yeah, Brindisa is definitely a, a place to go. And then some Spanish chefs. Now, here we have David Munoz, and this is really sad. He has had to close. I, he closed, he's only been here. His adventures last for over just over four years. Um, he's had to close. He was in, in Mayfair. But due due to the pandemic, it's had to close. Now he's incredible. He has brought fusion to a total different um, um, level. He worked in London. He was only in his early twenties when he worked in Nobu and he worked in Hakazan, and so he introduced a lot of that Asian fusion with the traditional Spanish food, and it is absolutely delicious. He's got three Michelin stars to his name. And yes, what you can see over his uh, shoulder, it is an octopus, yes. And what he, what he's wearing, what his staff is wearing is um, they wear straight jackets because it gets so crazy in his kitchen that that's sort of what they need to 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 cope. Um, I mean, absolutely fantastic, David Munoz. He's got two restaurants in, in, in Madrid. And well, let's hope that he comes back and, and, and tries again after the... Um, pandemic. And then we have Eneco. Now Eneco, he's very young. He, he's, he's received a lot of prizes. Like he's been um, named the young, the, the best young entrepreneur on the 40s. Um, and he's, he's won all sorts of prizes. He's got five Michelin stars to his name. And he opened um, in several places. He's opened in Lisbon and, and in London. Now the one in London, I can highly recommend. It's in the Aldwych. It's number one Aldwych, just in the corner. And it is, it, it's quite casual. You don't feel like you're going to this really posh restaurant. You don't feel you're entering the restaurant of a guy who owns five Michelin stars, but you can tell by the food. It's, it's, Basque food is always amazing. I mean, in the northern part of Spain, they cook uh, really well. And, and they have some really good lunchtime, um, Specials. It's, it's an excellent place to go for a celebration or and just try something different. I mean, as I say, Basque food is um, it's known for being very robust and very um, generous. And 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 yeah, an echo is just is is totally different. So totally recommendable this this restaurant. And then the last one, um, Kike da Costa. Now Kike da Costa, another five star Michelin chef. He's got a restaurant which is called Arroz, and this is quite important because. When you think of Spain, you in Spanish food, you think of what a gentleman is holding in his hands, and you would say, "Oh, that is a paella." Well, no, it's not. Paella is actually the pan that he's holding, but paella, the dish, there's a lot of dispute in Spain whether or not a dish is a paella or just an arroz, just rice. Now, um, a few years ago, Jamie Oliver created quite a stir in Spain when he decided to put chorizo in his paella, which they didn't really like in Spain. It was like it was like all over the news, and everyone had an opinion on it. It was it was massive. Now, um, if if you make paella, then it, it has to be the old traditional way, and has to have the right ingredients. But anyone can make an arroz, a, a rice. Now, no one can make it as Kike. Kike da Costa is just incredible, and this restaurant arroz is definitely worth your while. They use a wood fire. Um, oven and um i mean it, the taste is just second to none and uh, he's he's he started in a, in a little restaurant um he, he's from the west of, of the country west of spain uh, and he moved to the valencian area where the rices are so famous and he just started in el poblet in a tiny restaurant and then he ended up buying it and he ended up becoming this incredible chef and uh, yeah absolutely delicious so i mean this is obviously this list is not exclusive you've got other famous basque restaurants and i could recommend all of them i've just uh, chosen my three favorite ones so there they are and then do you know who this lady is i mean 
picture, you can tell it's in the 60s. I mean, don't know if there's any Eurovision fans here, but uh, yeah, she won Eurovision. She won Eurovision in 1968 with a song that didn't have a very difficult lyric. It was like la 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 la. It was the whole time la 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 la. I can't sing, but yeah, it was it was quite. Um, but it was a beautiful song. It was so happy, and it was. I mean, her smile was so amazing. Unfortunately, she won the year that uh, Cliff Richard um, also um, interpreted a very famous song. Congratulations! He came second, so she won, and she won in the Royal Albert Hall. Now, since then, the Royal Albert Hall has become sort of the mecca in Spain. So every artist that wants to be considered. A good artist in Spain has to have played in the Royal Albert Hall in London. Now, the person that has performed there a few times, and I've been lucky enough to see, is the gentleman you can see now, of course, Julio Iglesias. He's very well known, and he has performed several times in the Royal Albert Hall. We've also had um, other famous um, Spanish artists like Joaquin Sabina. He's very well known in Spain and in Latin America. And Rafael, who's another mm, incredible artist. Uh, they've all performed in the Royal Albert Hall. So, yes, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a very big thing in Spain, the Royal Albert Hall. We have other famous Londoners before we get to the royal family. Uh, the first one is Flores. Now, I don't know whether you've heard uh, of Flores, the famous perfume shop, but um, Flores originally came from, his name was Antonio, and he came from Menorca in one of the islands, uh, one of the Balearic Islands. And he started as a little barber shop and he made combs and he um, obtained a royal warrant, but he missed Menorca, he missed the flowers, he missed the scents. So he decided to uh, create perfume. Uh, and that's how, little by little, they became incredibly famous and they hold... Um, I mean, they're still owned by Flores and they hold um, 19 royal warrants. So, of course, they are the perfume uh, that is, I mean, they, they are the ones that that give scent to James Bond. He uses Flores. And they've made all sorts of special um, flower arrangements and perfumes for different um, weddings, royal weddings. Uh, the last one they did was the... Um, of course, when Harry and Meghan got married, and it was a unisex um, scent, so that was quite a nice touch. Then we have Michael Portillo. Yes, I know a lot of people don't realize, but his dad was Spanish. Um, he came here in the in the thirties during the turbulent years in, in in the civil war in Spain, and so yes, he he is um, from Spanish descent, which is why his name is it, you you pronounce it in Spanish as Portillo, and his father was from the southern part of Spain, and then. We've got a footballer now. The way he's, he's now he's wearing his, his Spanish tenue, but he's there in representation of all the. This is Regulion. He plays for Tottenham at the moment, but he's there in representation of all the Spanish footballers who've come to the Premiership. Now we've had uh, Mata, we've had um, David Silva, and and I mean. Uh, Santi Cazorla, there are too many to, 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 to mention them all. Roberto Soldado, many coaches as well. We've got Arteta, we've got Pep Guardiola. Now, the Spanish always have this thing for the premiership. Um, it's, it, it, there's a lot of admiration towards the premiership. So for a Spanish footballer to come out for a couple of years in the premiership is quite a big thing. So, yes, that's another um, big Spanish connection in London. And now we do come to the royal um, connections. And of course, the very first person to pop up is uh, the recently deceased Duke of Edinburgh. Now, the Duke of Edinburgh, he is related to the Spanish royal family through his uh, second niece. That's how we should call um, her, Queen Sophia of Spain. Now, both of them are descendants of Victoria, the eldest daughter of Queen Victoria. Um, and... Um, they, it's it's quite funny because there there is this uh, there's this picture of the 1980s when the king of Spain at the time um, Juan Carlos came to visit um, on a state visit and um, the, the four of them were were standing together and all four of them are descendants from Queen Victoria so they 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 from them too they they um, they come from the oldest daughter of uh, Queen Victoria and. Um, King Juan Carlos and, and the Queen. I mean, the Queen obviously descends from both, but uh, King Juan Carlos descends from the youngest daughter of Queen Victoria. So they're all very much related. And, and when they were there, they were they they'd done a special luncheon for the for a special reception at the embassy for the Queen and for the Duke of Edinburgh. And the King, who was always very funny and he was always making jokes, he um, he asked the Spanish reporters. 
um, he said, oh, come closer. I'll introduce my cousin to you, um, the queen, of course, because they're, they're all so related, uh, which is why now we've got a picture of our lovely Spanish family at the moment because um, uh, King Juan Carlos abdicated in 2014 and our king at the moment is King Philip. And there he is with uh, his wife, Queen Letitia. And uh, when Prince Philip passed away, he sent a telegram to the queen and called her dear auntie Lilibeth. So there is still quite a warm relationship. And the, the, the last official um, duty that the Duke of Edinburgh did, um, last state visit that he attended, was the state visit of Prince or King Philip, sorry, and Queen Letitia in 2017. Now, um, you can see they've got two girls, and uh, the oldest of the two, um, Eleanor, is actually the crown princess. And she's coming to study, not in London, but she's coming to study to the UK. She's coming to Wales, to Atlantic College, where she's um, starting to study next year. So there you see it. Again, we start with an Eleanor and we finish with an Eleanor, in this case, the crown princess. So, muchas gracias, as we say in Spain, and um, I don't know whether there are any questions. <laughs> Maria, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, who knew there were so many connections with Spain all right, all throughout London? Um, yeah, if you've got any questions from Maria, just put them in the chat, and we'll try and answer some of those uh, before we finish. Um, what is your favourite spot in London? What do you always take people when they come from Spain to London to visit? Where do you take them? I mean, well, obviously, if, if it, I mean, obviously, they absolutely love the Abbey. I mean, I think the Abbey is a big favourite for all nationalities, but um, in Spain, we, we love our churches. And I think the Abbey is just, it's this amazing place where there, there are quite a few Spanish connections, um, but also it, 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 it's just, it's sort of the cornerstone of the of the British monarchy. It's And, and, and they, they love that place because there's, they, they love the fact that so many famous people are remembered or buried there. It, it, yeah, I think that is one of the favourite places. So much history, isn't there? So many connections, not just with Spain, but of course um, throughout Europe. Um, and and to and to the Trafal, you know, to the Trafalgar Tavern in in uh, uh, Trafalgar Square because they they like the fish and chips as well. They like to try. <laughs> So, of course, you, you guide not only in English, you guide, I believe, in Dutch, Spanish, French, English and Portuguese. Have I missed That's any right. out? Yeah. <laughs> so it's worth saying that all, all our guides, we have over 600 guides and many of them guide in other languages than English. So if you want a tour in your native Spanish or Portuguese, then simply go to our website and you'll be able to find a guide. Yeah. Um, lots of comments from people all around the world. So Jane is watching in Kuala, Kuala Lumpur. Oh, um, someone in Liverpool. We have Bodo who's in love Norway. Norway. Oh, I love Norway. Beautiful. Uh, beautiful country, isn't yeah. it? Um, Peter is very keen on the extra year of Sydney. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Marilyn Maria Mariana is in Kiev. Ah, oh, wow, in Kiev. Lovely. Um, yeah, lovely. Um, Boodle of says has loved the multinationality of London because it, it is, yeah. isn't it? It's a very multinational uh, national society. It's amazing. It's got all these connections with everywhere in the world, and, and it, it is just everyone feels at home here. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it, there's something for everyone. This is yeah. one of the things I loved about the Olympics. There was like it was public for every country that was being represented at the Olympics, which is just amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's wherever you go in London, there's always somewhere you can find that's associated with your home country. Yeah. Um, Victoria agrees with you about um, the food. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've lost the, the comment now. I heard it just now. There you are. Um, Brindisa. Agreed. Yeah, Brindisa it's really good. There's, um, in, in the mornings for a morning coffee, they do the toast with with um, uh, tom with tomato and just some olive oil. Beautiful. Yeah. Excellent. We all have to go and visit. Um, Julie, you never knew Floris was Spanish. There you are. You see. You learn everything. Yeah, well, originally. There. I mean, now, obviously. Um, um, Mariana, yes, she, thank, thank you very much for um, telling us all about wonderful Spain. Um, we've got um, Ruby, he's in mm, Montreal. Montreal wow. <laughs> now, Jane's got a story. Jane actually met Michael Portelli. Uh, oh, wow. Something tick off there. Oh, wow. Um, and he's in here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yes, yeah, so, and Boodle, oh, yeah, yeah. So she's, she's got to go to Spain now as well. But you've got to go oh, to yes. London first, of course. Oh, first to London. <laughs> Um, brilliant. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Maria. That was, was fantastic. Um, you. If you want to know more about Maria, then go to our website, guidelondon.org.uk. You can then find Maria's profile. 
they tell you a little bit more about her, they tell you all about the language she, she works in, and it tells you availability as well. So that's the easiest way if you want to get into connection with Maria. And you can find all of our guides on our website as well. Uh, you can also um, find out some of the tours people do. So if you want a tour around about Spanish London, you can find that there. You can find all different nationalities there as well. But you can also find tours about museums and galleries. Um, you can see the Olympic Park there, Docklands. If you want a tour, then we can provide it. And if it's not uh, listed on the website, then just simply get in touch with a guide. I'm sure out of our 600 members, we can find someone um, who can put a, a tour together with you. And also have a look at the blog as well. Um, lots oh, of really interesting features on um, our blog posts. Um, for instance, there's one about the, the Duke of Edinburgh, um, who you mentioned there, um, who yeah. uh, died last month. So yeah, so and it is fascinating. You know, the, the, all these royal families all links back really to Queen Victoria. Um, <laughs> yeah, they can all, all trace their ancestry back. Brilliant. Anyway, thank you so much, Maria. Thank uh, you for having thank me. Thank you, everyone, for watching us. We'll be back next Tuesday. Uh, with another Guide London broadcast, so do join us for that. But from the both of us for the moment, uh, goodbye. <laughs>